Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is another AGI Asia Global Institute seminar. Uh, my name is Hei Wai Tang. I'm the director of the institute. Uh, we uh, had a lot of great events uh, before the summer. And you know, at the university, we have to take a break. Uh, and uh, today, I'm so glad to have a good friend uh, of AGI, uh, Dr. Ban Mang, to kick off the new semester uh, with a great uh, topic of discussion, which is going to be about climate investment. So my job today is just to do the introduction uh, and then, you know, we're going to have an Asia Global Fellow Diffuser from Ubiquiskind uh, to uh, do the moderation. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Dr. Meng uh, very briefly. Uh, he's the chairman of Asia Pacific, uh, as well as executive sponsor of sustainability and head of global private equity for Franklin Templeton. Uh, Dr. Meng has extensive uh, experience, uh, many years of experience in climate investment, uh, working in both the United States and China. Uh, so he has been um, in global finance industry uh, for many years, uh, previously deputy CIO of China's state administration of foreign exchange, as well as CIO of the California Public Employees Retirement System. As CIO of CalPERS, he was recognized for addressing climate change challenges and opportunities, pushing for more corporate reporting on sustainability and vigorously backing the pension's commitment to engagement. Uh, I'm going to spend uh, more time to introduce uh, Dr. Meng, uh, but he has a PhD, like me, uh, in, uh, from UC Berkeley. Uh, Go and, Bears. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Go uh, Bears. And actually, it's something more important, which is civil and environmental engineering. You know, I'm an economist. I only know how to talk. Um, and uh, so with that engineering background, you know, he has been pushing, uh, essentially, sustainable and sustainability developments in the financial industry. Uh, uh, very brief words uh, about our Asia Global Fellows, and by the way, many of them were sitting here in the front. Uh, they were from uh, 14 different countries, uh, spending three months in Hong Kong, uh, engaging in uh, very important uh, uh, visits and dialogues with thought leaders uh, and corporate leaders uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, and I was told that they're going to spend some time in Bangkok uh, in two weeks, uh, and then they would also take a trip uh, to Beijing and Shenzhen uh, later on next month. Uh, so you know, the goal to get the Asia Global Fellows is to ensure that you know, they have the opportunity to see Hong Kong, uh, to see Asia, and hopefully you know, after the experience uh, here, uh, three months of experience here, they can go back to their own uh, uh, sectors and countries and, and spread out the good words. Uh, so today, uh, my job is almost over because I'm going to turn to a diffuser later after Dr. Man's speech, uh, and she's going to be, uh, to be a moderator. And she's a human rights lawyer, uh, also a consultant for the World Bank uh, from Ubiscus time. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, uh, let me turn the stage uh, to Dr. Meng. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Harry, for the uh, very kind introduction. Good afternoon, honorable guests Ingrid, Kevin, my colleague Alan, Eitai, uh, Yvonne, some old friends, Casey, some new friends. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon to share with you something I've been working on for, uh, I, you know, uh, 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 here I said in the introduction, uh, for many years since my days uh, at CalPERS. Uh, climate change is real. Um, it just happened a few days ago in Hong Kong. I was watching the news in, in horror to see that happening in uh, such a beloved city in Hong Kong. Uh, now the challenge is how do we address this challenge? Uh, the key is how to bring capital to the table because addressing climate change will require a large sum of capital. And that does absolutely defy the ability of a public capital, uh, such as the philanthropic foundation, multilateral banks. Uh, they are doing great work, but far from being enough, which I will show you. Uh, so there are a few sessions of uh, this afternoon's talk. You know, I will talk about, uh, you know, the title is, we, we were approaching the inflection point of climate change. That was the title of uh, the article I published uh, two years ago at the Journal of Investment Management. And now I believe that we are already at the inflection point. I should not turn into the turning point of climate change to because of the speed of everything happening so rapid. Um, then I talk about the drivers for climate investing and then the enablers of climate investing. Uh, then I will end with uh, in the search of a green name. Green name, what do we mean green name as investor in order to bring capital to the table? You know, there has to be the right incentives. And so in this case, it's the return premium if you invest in climate solutions. So I want to uh, uh, touch upon what are the sources of uh, greening or potential return premium 
you can expect to earn by investing in climate solutions. Uh, so why inflection point matters, I'll quickly say, we have seen a rapid rise of ESG uh, investing. I listed a few statistics here. Just the last point, just last year alone, we saw more than US $1 trillion uh, uh, put into a uh, climate uh, solution. That's not enough. A large number, but still not enough. But you see the trajectory is increasing very fast. Uh, but also it comes with the rapid rise of ESG investing. It also came with greenwashing. And why I call at that point, two years ago, greenwashing unavoidable, I put a question mark. Why was it unavoidable? Because there's such a huge demand for solution into climate change. But then at the same time, there are no global standards. And also, if there are no sta global standards, there are no global synchronized regulation, it's very hard for you to enforce uh, the authenticity of the climate investing. So on one side, you have a huge demand. On the other side, there are no regulation, there are no data standards. So in a way, people naturally, okay, you want climate solution, you want an ESG product, I just change the cover here. You know, it doesn't matter what the product is, I just call it an ESG product. And so that's the definition for greenwashing. So greenwashing unavoidable. Then I say, now greenwashing no more. So what's the turning point of that is really in 2021. Uh, US SEC, the regulator of the largest capital market uh, in the world, issued a staff news alert letter, uh, basically saying that on the right, so SEC has two mandates, one to ensure the proper functioning of the capital market, and the other one to, to protect the investors. So in the, one of the two mandates in protecting the investors, SEC says that in the news alert letter, that firms claiming to be conducting ESG investing needs to explain what do you mean by that? And then uh, you have to do what you say. So that's in 2021. Then in 2022, uh, last year, we saw a global coordinated effort in regulators cracking down on greenwashing. So the most um, uh, sensational event was the raid of the uh, DWS office uh, by, the, uh, by the police uh, uh, last year, uh, in May uh, uh, 31st uh, uh, last year. Um, it was very dramatic. It was still, remember, that was still in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, you didn't need to send 50 policemen to read uh, empty office, right? And also in today, all the business done by electronically, not really much of a paper document in the office anyway. And also this was so synchronized with all the media. So it was very sensational in the media. And that's exactly the point by European regulators to send a warning signal, greenwashing no longer. And that quickly followed by the US SEC sanction of a BNY Mellon and Goldman Sachs. So uh, uh, global regulators are stepping up in terms of uh, 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 eradicating greenwashing. So that's a wholeheartedly welcomed. We'll talk about why you know, greenwashing was so uh, uh, damaging. Uh, then we, uh, my, co uh, my co worker and a dear friend, Anne Simpson, and I uh, published an article uh, on Financial Times saying that RIP ESG, so rest in peace, uh, uh, rest in peace ESG. But it didn't mean it's time for ESG to go. No, what we really meant, because in ESG, there's one missing uh, letter, uh, F, finance. So it means that we need it's time to bring finance uh, to the table. As I said, that just in energy transition alone, IEA estimated that every year we need trillions of dollars for many years, for decades to come. And that's absolutely defied the ability of a public capital. So how do we unlock the massive potential of the capital market, bring, truly bring capital to the table to meet uh, the challenge? So what's the capital market? How, how to bring capital market to the table? We believe we need two things. For one, investors need in quality, uh, investment grade quality data gave us the data so that we can develop climate analytics in terms of investment. And then also having data is necessary, but not efficient. You also need to give investors the right incentives in the form such as the carbon pricing. So these are two, uh, uh, two critical pieces in order to bring uh, capital to the table, information and the incentives. So, why do we say the inflection point, we, were, we are at the inflection point of, of uh, climate investing, but let's just take one step back. Uh, what, 
what is an inflection point? So this is inflection point basically things are changing so rapidly you cannot actual, actual you cannot extrapolate the past to project the future. And uh, this is a concept deeply rooted in evolutionary uh, biology. When we talk about evolutionary biology, uh, the first theory can, uh, comes to our mind is really Darwin's you know, uh, uh, gradualism, right? So in that theory is that you see a species evolves uh, gradually from the light yellow, I, I got the color wrong, light yellow, darker yellow, brown, and then you know, right, so basically, it's a, it's a gradual process. However, in 1972, uh, 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 Professor Aldrich and Gord published another theory. It's called punctuated uh, equilibrium. In both in the fossil evidence, uh, there are equal amount of fossil evidence supporting both theories. And if you see the punctuated, punctuated equilibrium theory, you see uh, inflection point, right? So almost nothing happens for a long time and somehow something happened, and then you jump to another uh, equilibrium. And that's where, when that happens, it's also uh, often represented as an ex existential risk, but at the same time, it uh, uh, can be great commercial opportunity as well. And that's where we're, we believe climate change is at the inflection point, is a punctuated equilibrium. And because of the two missing eyes, information, and incentive are developing very fast, are falling into place. The investor are getting what they need, and then the capital market, you know, the key is unlocked, the massive potential of the capital market. Um, one of the articles I'm working on now, because in the US, in a way, climate change is uh, politicized, and people are still debating. Uh, I want to, uh, the, the, another article I'm working on now, I call the capitalism solution to climate change. You know, climate change is not against capitalism at all. Actually, capitalism is the solution to climate change. We need to unlock the massive potential. So I use the punctuated equilibrium theory, just I look back because uh, I was training as an engineer, as uh, 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 Hewei just said, uh, engineer, I was a civil engineer in transportation. So I look at transportation. By the way, this is not uh, um, authoritative at all. I didn't, I came up with the a few equilibrium in transportation in my own mind. I didn't, uh, actually the paper will be uh, published on Journal of Investment Management uh, by the end of the year. So after that, after officially published, went through the peer review process, uh, um, probably will become one of the uh, theories there. So anyway, in my mind, the transportation, the first era, the first equilibrium is a horse carriage, right? This has been uh, uh, at least for thousands of years, 2,000 years. This is from the Terracotta Museum in Xi'an. You see the model. So it means that the horse carrier existed before the Qing Dynasty, right? That was 2,000 years ago. And this is the latest from the Qing Dynasty, so right before uh, the, uh, the, the Republic. So the first equilibrium call, I call the, uh, the horse carriage lasts at least more than 2,000 years, at least more than 2,000 years. And then came uh, in the early 1900, the internal combustion engine, right, with for the Model T. So that's I call the second uh, uh, equilibrium. So can you imagine from this era to that era, if you were in the business of raising horses, can you imagine the disruption to your business was you know dramatic? And uh, but then also think about the opportunity, the new opportunity created, uh, you know, because of the internal combustion engine, and also coincided at the same time, U.S. rolled out you know building all the highways, uh, in the Western countries. Right? So really a boost. So risk, existential risk, opportunities. Every time there's a punctuated equilibrium, inflection point, uh, there's, there's a risk and opportunities. People tend to focus on the risk but forget the opportunities. So the second equilibrium didn't last very long. Remember the first equilibrium I said last at least 2,000 years, right? Uh, you know, we can go back further. I'm sure it went back further. Uh, this didn't last long. The third era is an electric vehicle in the early 1990s. So it's really the Nissan Leaf is the first commercial viable, in my mind, first commercial viable electric vehicle that's in the 1990s. So this is from early uh, uh, 1900, this is the 1990s. So the internal combustion engine, the second equilibrium did not last more than, uh, did not even last 100 years. So it's very quick. Uh, so now the second era is so electric vehicles, and now we're at the first, the fourth era already autonomous vehicle. So this is uh, 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 
Valentine's Day uh, in, uh, this year in San Francisco, so we went out for dinner. I was used to see autonomous vehicle with no driver but their passenger. The idea there's someone in it, right? And you probably saw the news, San Francisco passed a law, uh, you know, autonomous vehicle can, can be fully run uh, in the city of uh, uh, San Francisco now. And that night, after dinner, we came back, you know, I uh, 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 look around, I saw a car driving next to me, no one in it. And I freaked out a little bit because I used to see at least either a driver or a passenger in it. At first, they require a driver, and then later it's okay, but at least a passenger. Uh, I was just some paying attention. I, I freaked out a little bit, uh, and then um, I was kind of in a little bit playful mode. I know this is publicized, so my insurance company wouldn't be happy uh, to hear this. So I kind of purposely, I kind of cut, uh, cut in front of the autonomous vehicle, right, to see was very responsive. It immediately slowed down and then turned on the indicating light to my right, right? And then I saw that, you know, I, I put myself back into my lane. It quickly just came back and then passed me, right? Totally ignoring me, passed me, no one in the car. So I'm, my point is the false era autonomous vehicle is here already. That's the 1990s, now it's 2020. So electric vehicle era did not last more than 30 years. More than 2,000 years, about 100 years and 30 years, and now we're at the fourth era. So with all the convergence of a technology, every time the equilibrium does not last as long anymore, so the disruption coming in much faster, mm -hmm. which means that the existential risk is even higher, but at the same time, the commercial opportunity is even bigger. So that's why we need to identify the inflection point, the turning point, and you, we need to get ready for one to solve the societal uh, uh, challenge, but at the same time, uh, you can make money. So my whole point is that you can do good and do well at the same time, and now is the time in climate change. It's coming. You can do good and do well at the same time. You don't need to trade off anymore. Because the philanthropical foundation, you know, my hat's off to them. You know, they were willing to compromise on financial return early on. And because of that and public capital, the technology was built up, right, was ready. And now it's ready for the capital market to take over because you can do good and do well at the same time. So I use transportation to show why uh, what's the inflection point and why inflection point matters. And quickly, you know, I don't need to convince you. We just went through the flooding in Hong Kong, right? Why do we do climate investing? Uh, before I saw this photo, you know, when you sit here looking up at the sky, you tend to think everything is unlimited, right? But once you see this photo, you, you realize literally there is a boundary, physical boundary to the planet Earth. And the resources that are available to us are not unlimited. So we need to take care of the planet to take care of ourselves. Uh, the other phrase I want to use is that uh, we are not trying to save the planet. The planet will survive. We are trying to save ourselves. We cannot survive. We may not survive. So we are doing all this. We save the planet to save ourselves. And of course, there are two billionaires, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, want to go to Mars, right? My point is that even Mars has a physical boundary as well. If we cannot solve the problem on planet Earth, we may mess up, plan, we may mess up the right marble as well, right? Escaping is not the solution. Let's solve it uh, on planet Earth. So what are the drivers of a climate investment? Extreme events, we have went through that. Expectation of civil society. Generation shift, younger generation, many of you, the AGI scholars, uh, uh, public policy, and then investor, last but definitely not least. So extreme events, you know, I, I did a long list of them for uh, 2022, they're also 2023. That's the inferno of California in the fall of 2021 was devastating. It's almost like the end of the world. I live in California. And then right after that hot inferno summer of California we never saw before is a deep freeze in Texas that Texans never saw before, right? So this climate change doesn't mean that it's warming everywhere. It's just becoming more dramatic, it's changing, right? So this, and then you, you can go on, uh, it's going on, you know, I was talking about 2023, January, or this year I was in Davos, you know, I'm not a skier, but many of my friends who went to Davos, they went there also for ski, there was no snow. And then right after that, I went to my hometown in Dalian. It was so cold, Dalian is known for the unfrozen porch, right? But when I was there, I don't know if the port of frozen or not, but from our uh, apartment looking down to the shore, at least 100 meters are frozen. Uh, so this is, is uh, uh, quite dramatic. Climate change is not possible. The problem will get worse until globally reach net zero, and then we'll start getting better. 
So that's the bad news. But the good news is that, as I said, you will see that the capital market is waking up, seeing the opportunity. So I hope the solution will accelerate with the capital market, public policy will, accel will accelerate the process. So because it's going to get worse before it gets better, I start changing my mind about two years ago. I think adaptation becoming more important than mitigation. Equally important, but I think we need to focus on adaptation. No, no matter how much we try, how hard we try today in mitigation, it won't be quick enough, it won't be scalable enough. So uh, I see more commercial opportunity in, in adaptation and more need in adaptation. Uh, I can uh, uh, skip for that later. The expectation of civil societies, as we know, civil society has a long history of civilizing the capital, of civilizing the financial market, uh, you know, and of civilizing the society. The end of child labor, the civil rights movement in the U.S., the end of the Vietnam War, the Greenpeace movement, uh, how to end the commercial whaling, uh, the Sunrise Movement, and the Greta uh, Thunberg. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, I grew up in mainland China. Uh, you know, uh, at that time, it was very poor. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, one of our neighbors had a black wax small TV, very small TV, very, very bulky. Um, I remember you know, we used to flock to their house for the evening news. And I remember seeing the Greenpeace, the brave young man and woman, they used to literally use their body to try to block the major, the big ship, right? The commercial whaling ship. And then commercial whaling ship was using a high pressure water or something to try to disperse them. And at that time, I was young. But I, their courage really left a very deep impression uh, you know, uh, 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 with me. So that was my generation. And now you have Greta Thunberg you know, and climate justice. So civil society played a key role. Because of the civil society, partially, Pop, uh, uh, and also generation shift, as younger generation care more and more about climate change, naturally because if you are the shareholder of the, f uh, of the planet, if you're a younger generation, you own more share of the future, right, than, 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 than us. So of course, naturally you care more. Uh, so because of the uh, expectation of civil society, generation shift, so it comes with the public policy. So in the interest of time, I wouldn't go through the public policy, but you see all major economies rolling out the public policy, in terms of uh, you know uh, regulating climate change and data, you know incentives. So this is all what, all the drivers for uh, uh, climate change. Um, so why public policy uh, so important? Uh, another example I want to use uh, for those of you the term uh, study uh, 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 economics. We know the term called the tragedy of the commons, right? So that's a term coined by uh, Professor Harold uh, 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 Garden who happened to be a professor from Berkeley in 1968, he publicized, uh, published a paper, uh, coined the term called tragedy of the commons. So which means that you know, if commons, if something critical to the say, the survival of the humanity, but it's free, so then everyone has a tendency to abuse or overuse it. And as a result, then it, it is the best, uh, is the worst outcome for, uh, for, for uh, humanity altogether. So, but what the theory came from, really from the fishing village, you know, or uh, how many cows you can, uh, you can raise or graze on a, a certain pasture, and uh, there are 10 farmers, you know, uh, maybe let's say they only can support 10 cows, so means each family should raise only one cow, but since it's free, so every family wants to raise two, three, more, 10, and then you destroy the livelihood for everyone. So that's a tragedy of common. Climate change is a typical example. However, good news is that there are solutions. So, Either you privatize the commons or you regulate the commons. Both of these solutions need public policy. So public, po public policy plays a very critical role in this. Last but definitely not least, investors. Investors, because normally we invest for the future, particularly if you invest in equity, right? You own, you want to invest in the, uh, invest the future. And you want a company to mitigate the climate change risk, but at the same time to capture new opportunities that are emerging from uh, 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 the transition to a low carbon economy. So investors are driving, uh, are driving this demand as well uh, for a uh, uh, climate solution. So these are the investors. So what are the enablers? I'll skip this slide. Uh, the enab enablers, one example is technology, right? So for look at the cost of uh, renewable energy. Uh, in many parts of the world, it's competitive uh, against fossil fuel. 
The only challenge, not the only challenge, the biggest challenge for renewable energy is the intermittent nature, right? So the, uh, then the critical investment areas find energy storage so that when there's no sign or no wind, you still can have energy. For those of you from Europe, I think one of uh, you from uh, uh, Holland, right? So, yeah, you're, so you know Berlin has the, store, uh, has the challenge. In summer, they produce 10 times more the energy they need, renewable energy, but in, in the winter, they don't have enough. Uh, so what is the, the you can cross season storage, utility scale, large scale storage for the city of Berlin. Otherwise, in the summer, you know, uh, Berlin gave all the uh, extra renewable energy to neighboring countries that overload their uh, grid system, and then they, in the winter, they need to borrow in you know, the import energy. So, but renewable energy in generation has become very competitive, so that has to be economical, so it become competitive. The other two en enablers now, so when two years ago when I uh, published uh, uh, the previous article, I was talking about we were missing the market need two, P, two I's, information and incentive. Um, back then, the, con the confusing part of these on data standards, information data standards, uh, there is a term coined by, a, prof uh, by a, uh, a group of researchers, some of them from MIT, they call aggregate confusion. Uh, what they do is that uh, what they did, they pull the ESG ratings, uh, the scores, from the six prominent rating agencies, and then they do a correlation. They find the correlation is very low, right? So because of that, because there's no standard, there are no uh, international standards on the ESG uh, data. So as a result of the aggregate confusion, everyone's confused. Um, investors are confused because investors, we don't know how to price in the uh, climate change risk. Uh, if I use uh, the data from one uh, uh, data provider, tell me this is good for the uh, climate change. If you use another uh, data provider, it uh, means it's bad. Very simple example, Tesla. Is Tesla green or dirty? So it depending on, you know, do you look at the full life cycle from the beginning of the battery all the way to the end of the recycling of the battery, or you only look at the middle part of the electric vehicle. And even that, the, the electric, electricity charge of the battery is a green, is a clean electricity or dirty electricity, right? So different, uh, because there are no standard, they're co uh, coming together now. So I'll show you the hope. The bad news is that it will get worse for a while, but the solution is coming. So you might are confused. Companies are confused too. There are many companies they want to do good by the society, but they don't know how. Because if they take one step, rating agency A will say you are good, but at the same time, the rating agency B will say no, 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 that's bad. Uh, you know, it's worse for the uh, for the climate. So companies are confused. Uh, you know, and then the, we cannot develop the investment analytics either. Uh, consumers are confused as well. You know, we want to vote with our wallet. I want to support clean company, clean products, but I don't know which company is clean, which one is not con uh, uh, clean. Regulators are confused as well if they want to enforce any environmental law according to whose data. So the lack of international standard and also the enforceable standard is a, was a big issue. So that was a challenge, but now let's see the hope. So the progress. The progress started um, uh, 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 last year. SEC proposed two major uh, uh, proposed uh, mandatory data disclosure, uh, it should become law by the end of this year because the U.S. is going through the public uh, hearing uh, uh, process now. There are two major components uh, for companies are uh, traded on exchange. Uh, they, are mandata they are mandated, uh, they are required to disclose climate risk uh, data. And also, uh, ICC recommend using the data standard from PCFD PCFD stands for Task Force of Climate Change Financial uh, 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 Disclosure. And then uh, there's IISB, International Standard, uh, uh, International Standard Something Board, International Standard Citing Board, uh, I believe so. So anyway, so they are the more international regulated 144 uh, uh, countries. The most recent development, I think about a couple weeks ago, so ISB and TSD, they are great. So basically, PCFD is going to collapse under ISSB. So that is becoming the global standard now. So the global standard is coming. Uh, China also indicated that uh, implement a similar measure. China, uh, the measure only applied to the, 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 the heavy polluting industry first, like a steel and cement company. 
uh, which is a good start. And also China is using TCFD data standard as well. So as you see, but Europe is already there, right? We know Europe is already required a mandatory data disclosure using TCFD. So now you have the three largest emitter uh, uh, of a greenhouse gas and those three largest economic block are moving to the same, director, uh, same direction, mandatory data disclosure plus using the same data standard TCFD. So this is not a small matter, it's a huge progress and gave me a lot of hope. Um, I, I would like to think because I published paper in 2021 and then all the stuff coming together in 2022, of course that's not the case. But my point is that is I, we were so encouraged about, by this move. So that's the first piece of missing eye information is being rapidly addressed globally, right? That gave us a lot of hope. The other piece of missing eye is the incentives, right? If you reduce economics into one sentence, it's people respond to incentives. If you want to change the behavior, economic behavior, you're changing incentives. So first, we need to remove these incentives. Basically means that the fossil fuel subsidies. There were a time for fossil fuel subsidies, I think in the 70s, after the oil embargo, right? Uh, a country like the US realized that uh, you know, we didn't have energy security. So we started adding a lot of uh, subsidies to the fossil fuel industry so that we could become energy independent. Now, US has become energy independent and also actually US has become one of the larger energy exporters already. Means that there's no need for fossil fuel subsidy anymore. So remove the fossil fuel subsidy so we can level the playing field and then add on carbon pricing, right? If you price the externality, well, I was talking about the tragedy of the commons, you know, the externality, you need a price on the externality. In this case, it's the carbon. So there are progress again, and uh, yeah, again in 2022. 20, uh, uh, so first, the, the, the GFAN, uh, you know, they endorsed uh, global, uh, they endorsed uh, carbon pricing. Um, in the U.S., uh, last year, the major one of the major uh, uh, regulation passed was the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, in that, is re U.S. did not use a stick approach. Stick means carbon pricing, but U.S. used a carrot approach, means that providing you know uh, uh, feed-in tariff subsidies to uh, uh, green energy and the climate uh, solutions. Uh, also, last year, more, uh, more significantly, the Europe, Europe adopted a carbon package with one of the three components they call, I call CBAN, carbon border adjustment mechanisms. So it means that Europe will charge you additional tax at the border, you know, depending on carbon footprint. At that time, people was arguing uh, that, you know, well, Europe is so clean, so ahead of the world already. You know, passing such a regulation in Europe does not really help the rest of the world, you know, that much. So again, my friend Anne Simpson, I, I want, we published another article, I want to say on Project Syndicate or somewhere, but so we're arguing that immediately, this is really good actually. It's going to have a global ripple effect because Europe does so much business with the rest of the world. And uh, fast forward, uh, since then in my global traveling, talking to uh, other countries who export to Europe, that they say exactly the same thing. Instead of paying a tax to European Union, they were rather using that money to develop clean technology onshore. So in this way, they can keep the technological benefit, economical benefit, and environmental benefit, right? So why would they want to pay a penalty to Europe if they can, in a way, uh, you know, develop clean energy onshore at home? So this is happening. And uh, now we see the uh, carbon pricing, uh, the uh, many countries, more and more countries are adopting a carbon price. Uh, I often get asked, people say, how, how much, what should be the right price of carbon? It's hard to put an exact price. I think most recently, US EPA estimates uh, by pricing directly on external, externalities such as public health, the damage to the infrastructure. Uh, I think your EPA uh, estimated more than uh, $200 per metric ton. In Europe, the uh, carbon market already traded above 200 euros per metric ton. So Europe, it is leading the chart on this. Um, another reason I like carbon pricing is that because carbon pricing generates revenue, so there's a kicker. So we can use that revenue, not back to the just transition part. Uh, you know, uh, we can use that money to redirect back to either develop new clean technology or to help the most vulnerable uh, part of the society, 
so we can ensure that the transition to a low carbon economy is a just transition, but or oh, at least we do not inadvertently create another form of inequality. In this case, will be climate inequality. So, uh, as I said, Europe, the carbon package they passed, there are three components, one of them being carbon tax. The other one is they set up a social fund, uh, basically using the money from carbon tax exactly for that purpose. So there's an additional advantage of having uh, put a price on carbon. And I, I try to use a, a, a very catchy title saying, climate change is priceless, let's put a price on carbon. So uh, that's one of the uh, uh, catchy titles I came up with. So the enabler on carbon pricing. So now I'll quickly talk about the green name, right? The investor needs to, see, uh, to be incentivized. Giving them data, giving us data is necessary but not efficient. I also need to make sure, because many of the capital, they're fee f uh, serving a fiduciary duty, like the pension fund, right? The fiduciary duty risk adjusted return. So it's not in their mandate to compromise on financial return. I, they had to earn the financial return. But my point now, you don't have to compromise financial return at all. Not only that, you potentially can, you can earn additional return premium by investing in climate solution. So here are the reasons. Um, uh, at the company level, uh, if you think about the top line revenue, given consumers and customers are increasing asking company to address climate change. And if you don't, they will vote with their wallet. They will buy product from your competitor who are greener, right? So that affects your top line revenue. Bottom line is our investors are increasingly asking company to mitigate climate change risk as well as capturing new opportunities in the transition to low carbon economy. And investors determine your cost of capital, that's your bottom line. In the middle, in terms of talent uh, uh, acquisition and retention, nowadays uh, uh, employee, particularly younger generation, again for many of you uh, in the room, when they select which company to work for, in addition to compensation, they care very much about what the company stands for, particularly on climate change. And we know that in the new economy, in the digital economy, you know, talent represents a big part of your operating cost. So your talent acquisition retention cost is representing a big part of your cost. So this is a top line revenue, bottom line cost of capital plus you know, uh, a talent uh, uh, retention cost. So this is all the layers of a potential uh, premium you can earn by being green. So this is a bottom line, uh, for, well, from bottom up, you see at the company level. Then there are also, um, i skip this one, there are top-down premiums. I also identify three sorts of top-down premium, or you can call market-wide beta. The, the three, as I mentioned, bottom up, almost uh, idiosyncratic specific to the company. Uh, market-wise, there's a market premium. The market, what I mean by market premium, very simple, carbon, uh, a price on carbon. If my investment can prove that I reduce one metric ton of carbon, I can turn that into the European trading market. I can cash in for 200 euro dollars, uh, uh, euro, or however the price was that day, right? So there's a market premium. There are also commitment premium. As more and more countries, uh, companies are committing to net zero, they will need a solution how to get to net zero. So the fact that more and more people are making the commitment means the demand you know, for such a solution will be higher and higher, and naturally that should lead to some kind of return premium. The last one I didn't think of until the, the war between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine broke out. Uh, of course the war, you know, to say the least, is a humanitarian crisis, but at the same time the war really woke up many countries for two national security concerns, energy security and food security. What's the best way to get energy security? Actually it's renewable energy, right, because no political adversary country can stop the shine from shining or wind from blowing on the land. As long as you can solve the energy storage problem, you can achieve energy security. And similarly to uh, food security as well, right? You want to grow your food on your own land. Not many countries are as fortunate as the United States of America, where I live, that has both energy security and food security, right? Uh, regions like Europe has food security but no energy security. China has barely, f barely food security, uh, but no energy security. Uh, Middle East have energy security, but no food security. Africa, depending on where you are, you may not have neither. Singapore has neither, right? So then how do you get uh, 
food security for the countries not as fortunate as the U.S. In a way, it's a precision farming, vertical farming, go to Singapore. You know, you c that's the one way you can get your uh, food security. So it just so happened energy and food also represent uh, almost uh, two-thirds of the greenhouse, ha uh, greenhouse gas emission. So uh, when you provide a solution to energy and the food, security, uh, food, even though from the perspective of climate change, but at the same time you are offering national security benefit. And every time when we talk about national security, people and country are willing to pay. So that's another potential source of uh, uh, greenium, the return premium. And we're hoping because of these different sources of return premium, you don't have to uh, invite capital to come to the table. Capital will come to the table. It's coming to the table already. And that's where I believe we're at the turning point from the inflection point to the turning point. What I mean by turning point, you can make good money now as well. Not just doing good by the society. You can do well and do so well. And it's a massive scale many, many years to come. As I just said, it will get worse for many decades before it gets better. Um, so in conclusion, I want to say that in the past uh, two years, uh, you know, uh, the two gaps, two, two missing eyes, information incentive, are being closed very rapidly. And if I use a traffic light analogy, two years ago when I published the first article on journal investment management, the traffic light was red, right? And now it's flashing yellow. And you want, now you want to get ready. When the first ye flashing yellow turns to green, you want to be the first one out of the gate, capture the market opportunities. And that's where it's, it's the uh, turning point. Uh, speaking of the rising of the challenge, uh, this book came out during the pandemic. I remember uh, vividly, we were locked down at home. At that time, I was running uh, CalPERS portfolio, literally from my kitchen table, $500 billion portfolio, and I was trying to read a book. And reading that book gave me goosebumps, right? We were able to come up with effective vaccine and treatment in a short period of time because of what? Because of uh, we have capital, collaboration between public sector, private sector, public policy, we focus on science, not the politics, we have the solution. And uh, pandemic and climate change are very similar in, uh, in different ways, right? Neither the virus nor uh, the greenhouse gas emission respect the national borders. It requires global collaboration. And also, both are science, not politics. So it means it requires data, capital, public policy, innovation coming together to solve the problem. And we just did. We solved the problem of the pandemic. And with the same playbook, global collaboration, capital, public policy, uh, public and private sector co uh, uh, collaboration, and the innovation, we can solve the problem of climate change as well. So that's my uplifting message. We can do it. We did it again. And yes, we can do it again. To overcome the tragedy of the commons, we must move from the inflection point to the turning point of climate change and together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I think uh, it was very insightful. And many of us who are in climate, in investment, in business, in civil society, very much interested in what you just discussed.